video, Machine Consciousness, What's Required. In this video, I want to address three main issues regarding machine consciousness. First, a statement I often hear is that it's only a matter of time before computers become conscious. I want to discuss why we may eventually develop machine consciousness, but it won't be achieved in today's digital computers. Second, I want to present my thoughts on what would be required before we could say that a machine had the potential to be conscious. And third, once this requirement is satisfied, I want to demonstrate how it might be employed into a simulation of one of the key intellectual modules of the evolved mammalian brain. My first point. I'm often puzzled when I hear people say, it's only a matter of time before computers become conscious. This may be accurate if, by the word computer, people mean any electronic device that you can imagine. But in the truest sense of the word, as is typically used today, computer refers to a device that is modeled after a von Neumann machine. And unless I've missed something, everything that Intel has produced that it calls a computer is still based on von Neumann architecture. A von Neumann machine relies on a very specific set of instructions, i.e. a program, that essentially manipulates numbers. It performs operations on them and then stores them in certain memory registers. Typically, the nature of these registers and the electronics by which these programs are executed is nothing more than transistors, which are fairly simple solid-state switches. There may be millions of them in today's microprocessors, and they may switch on and off very quickly. But as far as I can tell, there's nothing in all of this that would indicate or provide a basis for machine consciousness. Yes, clever programmers can write clever scripts that make it appear as if a computer is thinking or talking or even intelligent, but at the end of the day, they're really doing nothing more than behaving as programmed machines. So, what would qualify as a requisite for machine consciousness? Well, if we define consciousness as being similar to what we experience as humans, I would think that at a bare minimum, there would need to be something equivalent to qualia. Qualia is the term that cognitive scientists and philosophers use when talking about sensory experiences, e.g. the color yellow, the taste of peppermint, or the sound of a 440 hertz tone. It could also include emotions like sadness, bodily aches and pains, and feelings related to moving our arms and legs. And I don't see anything on a modern computer that even comes close to simulating qualia. I believe that before a machine could be deemed to be conscious, it would at least have to have something equivalent to qualia. In one of my recent videos titled Solving the Hard Problem of Consciousness, I suggested that what provides the basis of our first-person experiential qualia is the electromagnetic activity found coursing about the neural columns of our brains. Typical neural columns consist of about 100 neurons in very close proximity, and all of them more or less firing at the same time. In essence, I believe it's possible to view these neural columns as qualia generators, or perhaps a better term, qualions or qualionic resonators. In essence, each neural column has its own unique electromagnetic signature due to the unique character of its constituent members, as well as differences in what it's connected to upstream. At any rate, in order for a machine to be conscious, I believe it needs to have an effective sensory alphabet of these qualionic resonators. They don't necessarily need to be neural in nature, nor even electromagnetic, but they do need to have some type of temporal duration or a sustained presence. I now want to demonstrate how these qualionic resonators might work, how they fit into one of the key intellectual modules that are employed in the mammalian brain. I call this intellectual module a likening module or a likening engine. The underlying concept is that as you wander about your environment, you continually encounter objects and situations. To keep it simple, let's focus on objects. As we encounter these external objects, we're also presented with internal imagery from our memory. Sometimes these internal images correspond to the exact object in front of us. Sometimes they correspond to objects that are only partially similar or partially like them. Here's an example. Imagine you're walking down a busy city street daydreaming about something. Up ahead, you see a person that reminds you of your Uncle Bill. That is, your attention is drawn to this person ahead of you who seems to be wearing the same kind of funky hat that your Uncle Bill always wears and the same type of long red hair that he has and also seems to be wearing the kind of army jacket that he often wears. You're fairly certain it might be him, but not entirely. There's something that causes you to doubt. To determine if in fact it is your Uncle Bill, 
you'll compare the external real image against an internal one from memory. That is, your attention may try to conjure up an internal image of your Uncle Bill as a basis for comparison. As you do, you recall that your Uncle Bill also has a rather noticeable limp, and he also doesn't smoke cigarettes like this gent ahead of you seems to be doing. Eventually, you convince yourself that it isn't your Uncle Bill, but merely a close resemblance or likeness. We liken things and situations continually and almost effortlessly. Whether we're walking down a city street, strolling through an antique shop, or carrying on a conversation with someone, our brains assess the underlying, contributing, qualitative subcomponents of an object. And based on their commonality with other previously encountered objects, we make some assessment regarding its similarity or likeness. I now want to demonstrate how this likening process might work schematically. So, to start, imagine a machine or a robot that does nothing but wander through some rather contrived environment, encountering balls on poles. The balls come in three different colors, green, magenta, and blue. The poles come in three different heights, low, medium, and high. At the base of each pole is a speaker that emits a pure tone in one of three pitches or frequencies, low, medium, and high. There are sensors that detect the height and color of the balls, as well as a microphone. The information from these sensors is then transferred to the likening engine, which resides inside the robot. Inside the robot, you can see two arrays or banks of qualianic resonators. <clears throat> on the left is a set that corresponds to activity in the external world. On the right is a type of duplicate set called the internal set. So, in this case, as the robot is inspecting a blue ball on a medium-high pole, we see the corresponding resonators becoming active, as well as the one that corresponds to the high frequency coming into the microphone. Because of this activity, the corresponding internal resonators also become active due to the connecting cable between each one. And this stimulates the initiation of a pattern recorder. Whenever two or more internal resonators become active at any time, a pattern recorder develops to capture this event. Similarly, in this frame, our robot encounters another ball on a pole. This time it's a magenta ball on a tall pole with a low frequency sound. And as in the last case, we see the corresponding external resonators becoming active as well as the corresponding internal resonators. And because two or more internal resonators have become active, another pattern recorder begins to develop to capture a memory of this pattern. I now want to demonstrate how this likening process would work. Let's imagine that the robot has encountered and instantiated a number of balls on poles, as evidenced by all of the pattern recorders. And we'll also assume, for the sake of discussion, that for some reason, during this present encounter, there's no sound coming from the speaker. So, we see the corresponding resonators becoming active, both external and internal. This, in turn, has stimulated some of the individual tentacles or links of the pattern recorders. In this case, pattern recorders B and C each have a single tentacle affected, but A has two stimulated links. Because a certain threshold has been exceeded, the entire pattern recorder now becomes active, stimulating the qualianic resonator that corresponds to frequency. This would be perceived by the likening engine as a memory event, a memory of an object that is similar to or like the object currently being encountered. From a first-person perspective, this would be equivalent to having a remembrance or experiencing an internal image of Uncle Bill. So, this was just a rather quick flyby of the basic elements of the likening engine. The schematic was kept intentionally simple to demonstrate the basic principle and to demonstrate the role of qualianic resonators vis-a-vis -a, -vis a conscious machine. There are several other key elements that would be required in an actual functioning system, and I intend to cover these in a later video. For now, however, I just wanted to state why I don't believe von Neumann-type machines will ever become truly conscious, and offer an approach that I believe would. Well, that's all we have time for right now. Thanks for watching. I hope you found this video enlightening. Please be sure to post your comments, questions, and criticisms. I'm Jeff Kosmoski. God bless, good night, and drive safely.